Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And we're continuing uh, studying the topic of heaven. Uh, this is the sixth episode. And if you haven't seen the first five episodes, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, each of the episodes is about two hours, hours long. And some, some people are surprised that you can... How could you even talk two hours about heaven? Well, I expect we're going to end up talking about 40 or 50 hours altogether about heaven before we get finished with this subject. There's a lot to learn about it. It's, it's very, very exciting, and I, I hope you enjoy uh, watching it as much as we enjoy discussing it. Um, so the t title of this uh, series is Heaven, All Your Questions Answered. And first let me start by introducing the panelists. Uh, let's... Uh, Let's start with Brother Eric. Hey, Eric here. Uh, Jesus Knight 72 is my YouTube channel, and i um, happy and blessed to be here as always. Okay, thank you for joining us, Eric. And uh, next we have Brother Jackson. Hey, Jackson here, and my YouTube channel is Mecca Wing Zero. That's the word zero, not the number zero, or letter zero number zero, and the letter and number confused there. Anyway, I got this book for Christmas called Shall Never Perish Forever by Dennis Roxer, and I guess this, I guess we could say this program is sponsored by, like, almost like it's a commercial happening right now. I really recommend this book and everything. It's really great, and it's filling me with joy as I'm reading it, so. Okay, what was the name of that again? It's called Shall Never Perish Forever by Dennis Roxer. All right, good. Well, I'm sure if Jackson recommends it, it's, it's very worthwhile. All right, thank you for joining us, brother. <laughs> and, and last, but certainly not least, we have Brother Mitch. Hello, everybody. I'm um, just happy to be uh, in this uh, discussion. It's much better to talk about heaven than to think about the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mitch. And uh, I, I hope that Mitch can uh, be in a little bit more of a cheerful mood this time. Lately, he's been a little oh, bit too glum and somber. He's just so dead serious all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you see, you see, brother, that was what I call Luke's attempt at humor. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Luke, usually warm, I, Luke, Luke, right, okay. Usually when I attempt humor, it requires a follow-up explanation that, well, I, that was a joke. <laughs> okay, we're, uh, what we've been doing is uh, there's a book called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Oh, good, Austin's here. Yeah, and uh, we're going through this book just page by page, and uh, there's a lot to learn in this book. There's pro he probably hey, has about hey, 100 guys, questions. Hard. Hey guys, I'm really sorry. I'm just coming in to say I won't be able to make it today. I gotta go feed my grandparents. You're gonna feed them? Yeah, but I pray everything goes good, guys. I hope it's a good, uh, a good show today. Okay. All right, brother. Thanks for dropping by. Have hey. a good one, guys. Okay. Bye. -bye. bye. Take care, bud. Huh. Okay. Um, so uh, in Randy Alcorn's book on heaven, as we work through it, um, he has many questions. I expect by the time we get through the book, there'll probably be maybe a, at least 100 or 200 questions he asks about heaven, and then he attempts to answer the question using scripture to support uh, his uh, conclusions. So right now we're beginning chapter 8, and as I said, if you haven't seen the previous uh, ones, you really need to go back and watch them so that you, otherwise there's some terminology and things we're going to say that uh, may escape you. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, chapter uh, 8, and... Um, Let's, uh, it says, many books on heaven say nothing about the new earth. Oh, first of all, the question, the title of the chapter is, this world is not our home. Or is it? You know, <laughs> that's the question. Is this world earth our home or not? So he says, many books on heaven say nothing about the new earth. Sometimes a, a few paragraphs, vaguely worded, are tacked on at the end. Other books address the new earth, but undercut its true nature. Quote, is this new earth like our present earth? Probably not. Uh, unquote. Uh, but if it isn't, why does God call it a new earth? 
Uh, one author says, quote, the eternal phase of heaven will be so unlike what we are familiar with that our present language can't even describe it, unquote. <laughs> Certainly our present language can't fully describe it, but it does in fact describe it, uh, such as Revelation 20, chapters 21 and 22. Many religions, including Buddhism and Hinduism, characterize the afterlife as vague and intangible. Christianity specifically refutes this notion. Biblical Christianity does, doesn't give up on humanity or the earth. Uh, Paul Marshall writes, our destiny is an earthly one, a new earth, an earth redeemed and transfigured, an earth reunited with heaven, but an earth nevertheless. Okay, um, I think the first thing to be said about this is uh, obviously we're moving on to a new uh, subject in our discussion and that is the new earth and we've been talking about the new heaven the new earth we've been talking in the past about this uh, phase called intermediate heaven and that's if someone uh, were to to die right now a, a Christian they would go to this intermediate heaven so that's what we've discussed in the previous uh, shows uh, now we're going to move on and talk about the eternal heaven, which is earth and heaven united together. But uh, uh, what do you think of these comments so that he's uh, quoting from other authors that say that uh, we probably couldn't even begin to even understand what uh, what it'll be like? It's just uh, it, it's so unlike what we are familiar with. Do you expect that to be the case as we go through this study or not? I think I think it actually makes us a little bit more familiar, because you see, in the, in, in, everybody else's idea of heaven is this existential thing, whereas this idea of heaven is a new earth, like we're just walking into, but not the same as the earth that's here. So it actually makes me feel more comfortable, more familiar with the fact that there's going to be a, a new earth, as if we're gonna we're gonna walk the, this planet. But the, this planet will not be have a fallen state. It will be in a perfect state. Mm -hmm. um, that actually gives me more comfort. So I don't really feel that that, that that idea makes me feel like it's unfamiliar. It makes me feel as if Earth, to me, is more familiar. Yeah. I think I think the quotes here that you mentioned, the one quote about being so so unlike what we're familiar with, I, I think it's those are some of the problem quotes that set the foundation for the concept that don't even waste your time trying to understand it because you're, it's so unlike what we're familiar with. There's no point in trying to understand it. Yeah. Well, the other thing, let me just also say this. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I'd be very surprised if this doesn't apply to other people too. If you ever just imagine like some really good reality or whatever, something like maybe a tropical island or some other beautiful setting or something, there's always a physical aspect to it, and it's not just I'm floating around in some mysterious realm of infinity. Uh, I, maybe I misunderstood you. I, you're talking about other viewpoints on heaven. There is or is not a physical reality. Well, what I'm saying is I'm talking about this point of view, about the new earth and stuff. Oh, yeah. I'm analyzing the pleasure, the pleasurability of it because I don't. In other words, I can't speak for everyone, but most of the time, when when the, when someone will say picture some really really good reality, almost always there's some physical quality to it, and it's not just a bunch of floating around in infinity or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think he makes a good point here in this paragraph, to saying, "Well, why would he even be called the the?" the new heaven and the new earth mm -hmm. if you know mm -hmm. why if it's not going to be like earth why don't if it's going to be totally different then why do why even call it earth if it's not yeah. like earth yeah and I, I think that's what Jackson's kind of saying he's saying when people even imagine their idea of what a paradise quote unquote is it involves familiar things it involves um, and I think that's what he was saying it's, it, it involves um, crystal clear cool water cool breezes uh, the sun shining on you you know trees swing and you know it, it's it's all things we are familiar with so it wouldn't make any sense to make something like that a heaven to us or a paradise to us that's something completely unlike anything we are familiar with wouldn't make any sense well I, I think you just interjected in a very important word there uh, in, in place of heaven or interchangeable with heaven you used the word paradise <laughs> mm -hmm. and if we were to ask people to describe paradise 
they would describe it in a in an earthly like the Garden of Eden or some earthly description. They wouldn't think of it in terms of some spirit realm that's non-physical, you know. And so, um, is it correct that heaven and paradise are interchangeable terms? I kind of look at heaven like a city, and earth like the like 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 the country. I almost look like look at heaven like Hoboken, New Jersey. If you ever seen Hoboken, it's really nice. Uh, when the flood hit it, but but you know it's like one of them really nice cities. Everybody hangs out, everybody parties. It's where all the action is going on. <laughs> it's almost like Las Vegas, I guess, but only you know without all the sin. <laughs> without it, all the sin, Las Vegas would be what though? <laughs> you're right, exactly. So oh, that's, that's wouldn't that's have any right. intrigue. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, Luke. Now, see, Luke was telling us. Actually, there are some very pretty places there. There's, there's there some are. very nice places there. Actually, yes, yes. Yeah, so I, let's. I, uh, even so, though, so. even though Las Vegas offers uh, tremendous opportunities for people to uh, sin, uh, there are still a lot of wonderful <laughs> things that you can do in Las Vegas that uh, are not sinful. Okay. Um, okay. Good point. So uh, he, he says talks about our longing for Eden. Uh, we are homesick for Eden. We, we're we nostalgic for what is implanted in our hearts. It's built into us, perhaps even at a genetic level. We long for what the first man and woman once enjoyed, a perfect and beautiful earth with free and untainted relationships with God, uh, each other, animals, and our environment. Every attempt at human progress has been an attempt to overcome what was lost in the fall. Well, um, I think travel will be probably free. Travel? Yeah, like, like if you want to go somewhere, like in a new heaven and a new earth, like. You know, you don't have to worry about these, you know, getting a plane ticket. And there's definitely no TSA people there, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Well, maybe everything's free. I don't know if we're going to even have any kind of com commerce uh, going on or not. I, but, uh, I had to charge people, Luke, and they don't. They seem to want everything for free. I'm not yeah. like this idea as a businessman. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of people who are praying you to do intercessory prayer for them, I understand. So... <laughs> Um, okay, but he's he's really making the point here that he's saying we even have probably deep within inside us this innate desire to be in Eden in paradise, and uh, I mean obviously that was that was made for us, paradise, Garden of Eden that was made to be our home, and Adam and Eve lived with and God walked with them uh, in in paradise, and that was God's plan. And as we go through this, we're going to find that God's going to make that plan a reality. Uh, but uh, the, the, all of the symptoms and problems from the fall of man, from Adam and Eve, uh, those are going to be all removed and we'll have paradise back how we, it was, maybe even better than it was originally. What was the name of that book, Paradise Lost? Wasn't it? Yeah, there was a book called Paradise Lost. And... Uh, and, and now we're we're going to have another one called Paradise Regained. Mm. That's that's really the whole concept of the Bible. It really, I think, is that Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. And we're moving into the part now where we're going to discuss how how it's going to be like, what it's going to be like once we regain it in eternity. He says John Eldridge, uh, in the the book uh, The Journey of Desire tells the parable of a sea lion who had lost the sea and lived in a desert where it was dry and dusty. But something inside him longed for what he'd been made for. Quote, how the sea lion came to the barren lands, uh, no one could remember. It all seemed so very long ago. So long, in fact, it appeared as though he had always been there. Not that he belonged in such an arid place. How could that be? He was, after all, a sea lion. But as you know, once you have lived so long in a certain spot, no matter how odd, you come to think of it as home. How do you think that uh, fits as an analogy to... Oh, I definitely ha hate this world. You more hate this and more. world? 
I, you know, well, how could I, I, I think I could put it to you this way. Although you know me and, and we have some fellowship here, by and large, my life is alone. My, uh, my whole world is not very good at connecting with people. Even if I knew you guys in person, I don't know how I would be able to actually connect with you because I, I can't, like, on a one-on-one -on -one level, I'm not good at connecting with people. I, I, can't, I can't get that back-and-forth touch very easily from people having autism. Uh, it's, a, it's a very lonely world. I've often had a lot of dreams where I was alone in these beautiful places but with nobody to share it with. It's, it's very strange, and I know it seems like we're all having a good time, but I don't like to be touched. I'm not a touch type person. I, 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 I'm in a very lonely world. This is, this is what I've been brought up in. Hmm. Well, I, I would say obviously that's atypical, even though, and that's, isn't that a term that you and Austin? Right, well, you're, I'm, not, I'm definitely atypical. I'm not normal, but, the, but also the other things in the world I can't fit with. <clears throat> Yeah. I can't fit with the society that's being marked. Everything uh -huh. is being marked everywhere you go. I can't fit with Big Brother. I can't fit in a world, in a, in a, in a socialist world, where everything is trying to throw people together, from public toilets all the way down to public school, public this, public that. Everything's public, public park. You go to the park. I want to be alone. I'm the type of person I, 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 I maybe a few of my friends close by, my family majorly, because those are the only people that I really know and, and are, mm -hmm. are tight with. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, uh, so this world, I just, I, I, I fit in like a total square peg. Yeah, so just as the sea lion doesn't really fit in the desert, uh, Brother Mitch doesn't really fit in this world today. And uh, I think that the point that Randy Alcor is making is that probably universally correct. We really don't fit here the way it is right now, uh, because uh, we were really made. Uh, the God's purpose was for us to live in this Garden of Eden, the paradise that will be restored in the future, and that's where we'll spend eternity. But right now we're in this in-between state. We're living on the earth, but it's a fallen world, and it's it's not really ideal. Uh, so. There are a lot of people, I think, that are really, really quite comfortable and happy with the way the world is right now. But uh, I agree, brother. I, I look around at the world, at all the things going on in the world, and and the view, general viewpoint of, of the people in the world, and um, I don't fit either. And I, but it's not like I'm miserable. Sometimes I get quite upset, especially when I watch the news and I see politics and stuff like that I can I can start yelling at the TV and I get very irritated with what's going on in the world uh, but yet I also am able to adapt enough kind of like the sea lion you, you feel well okay you learn how to live here anyway and I still am able to have relationships and have my pleasures of life and enjoy this world even though this is not the the condition of the world that uh, that God really had in plan for us right well you have to see that Heaven, if it's a place where it takes away the one autistic trait that I hate the most, and that's my inability to connect with people. I kind of want to have selective being able to connect with people because on one level I, I, I want to connect with people. On another level, there's a lot of people I don't want to connect with. But I think in heaven I want to connect. It will, be, it will be something different for me. It's something that I can't even fathom that I'll actually be able to, 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 to hug and hold and, and touch with people and be a touchy-feely type of guy. And yeah. Enjoy that that back and forth between people that I really can't I can't even imagine it on earth. I've always longed for it, but I I, 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 I can't have it. I can't tell you the 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 hell that I that 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 end of Aspergers is is a is a type of I don't know what you want to call it a, a yeah a real a real curse. Yeah. Well, I I don't know what percentage of the population has Aspergers like like you and and uh, Jackson. It's pro it's probably very low, isn't it? One percent or less. No, well, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, it's, it's pretty low. Okay, so we know that you guys have a, an extra burden as far as fitting into the world. Uh, Eric and I don't have Asperger's. I, I expressed how I feel, how I'm comfortable in some ways and uncomfortable in others. How about you, Eric? I, I think it's um, and this goes for whether there may be a different condition for for Jackson and and Mitch. And us, um, I think it speaks to what God tells us about the fact that you know it's a constant reminder we are not of the world. 
you know, so we're not supposed to be comfortable in this world. We're, we're, our, our focus is supposed to be eternity and heaven and to be in, in the place and in the bodies and, and fellowshipping with the people we're supposed to the way we were intended. So we're, we're really, in a way, it's not a bad thing because it keeps us from getting attached to the world. I look at the events that happen around the world, and I can't – I have such a, uh, such a huge problem dealing with what people see as progress. I mean I look around the world and I see the things that are happening in the world. You can see the signs of the times. You can feel the signs of the times. They're all right there to, to be seen. And yet the world, just like Jesus describes it, you know, as in the days of Noah, the people would be marrying, giving in marriage. They'd be living their lives as if nothing's wrong, even though the world's very wrong. It's in terrible shape. Um, people will be acting like it's not. And I can't get over this, This well, you look, New Year's was the big celebration we have all over the world. Everybody does this celebration. And, and I, I look, just look around, and then you, you, you read the news, you see the events that are happening, and say, what exactly are you celebrating? I mean, this is not a good time. Things are not good. Yet people walk around acting as if it's wonderful and it's the best times we've ever lived in because we have a, a phone that can text somebody or because we have a... You know, it's amazing the things that people focus on or what passes for uh, progress or what passes for good in the world. Um, there are good things. There are good. Is the world in and of itself bad? No. There are good things in the world that God has created. I mean, there's beauty in the world that we see, you know, the trees, the seasons, the, the different, you know, there's, sure, there's lots of things we experience because God created it that way. But when you look at man in the world, we're not supposed to love this world. We're not of this world. When we were reborn in Christ, when we became new children, uh, God's children, you know, our, our home became something different for now until it's changed and made the way it's supposed to be. I think that uh, using his analogy of the, uh, the, the sea lion in the living in the desert uh, is that uh, we're, we're not... Uh, we're not going to ever feel really completely at, at home because it's not our natural, our natural uh, habitat. I mean, uh, God intended us to be in the Garden of Eden where it was wonderful and perfect, and then this fallen state, even though I can still see beautiful waterfalls and mountain scenery and gorgeous flowers and lovely scents and all these th things that were wonderful, it's all diminished the best of what we have right now is far less than what it was before the fall. And that's what we have to look forward to. We know that uh, even though we can try to make the best of this bad situation, living in a fallen world, uh, we know we have uh, a wonderful thing to look forward to when it's all restored. Paradise will be regained. Uh, okay, he says, uh, our ancestors came from Eden. We are headed toward a new earth. Meanwhile, we live out our lives on a sin-corrupted earth between Eden and the new earth, but we must never forget that this is not our natural state. Sin and death and suffering and war and poverty are not natural. They are the devastating results of our rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. yeah. He says, uh, Adam was formed from the dust of the earth, forever establishing our connection to the earth. Uh, just as we are made from the earth, so too we are made for the earth. But you may object. Uh, Jesus said he was going to prepare a place for us and would take us there to live with him forever. That's John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. Yes, but what is that place? Revelation chapter 21 makes it clear. It's the new earth. That's where the new Jerusalem will reside when it comes down out of heaven. Only then will we be truly home. So uh, the point he, he driving home here is we were made from the earth, but not only made from the earth, we were made for the earth. We were not made for some a non-physical spiritual realm of existence. We're made for the earth. Any reaction to the, to those points? Yeah, I, I I I absolutely agree that 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 the new heaven was. Well, look, look at Adam and Eve were, were were living in the garden, right? And and everything was there provided for them. 
It was paradise. And then they ate of this knowledge of good and e good of evil, right? And and all of a sudden they lost paradise. And now when Christ came and, and redeemed that, right, it brought us back to paradise again. But in, in but this time I think in paradise we'll appreciate paradise where Adam and Eve could have never appreciated it because they didn't know what they lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Adam and Eve are going to appreciate it in the future, though. Do we can are we all assuming that Adam and Eve uh, will be with us in eternity, or that they they got reborn again also, and and uh, and they even though they they were lost, uh, that that uh, they're going to be also with us in heaven, or, or are they going to hell? They're the ultimate grandparents. Yeah. I see no uh, scriptural indication to believe that Adam and Eve weren't saved. Yeah, I don't either. I think most people assume that they would be, but uh, I'm not sure I can support that either through scripture, but I would, yeah, I would I, just assume. I, I was going to say, it's an interesting question because it's, it's not really discussed. <laughs> it's, we don't really, because of the special circumstances that they were in, um, being the first people there, being... You know, so uh, it's an interesting question. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> well, well, it was revealed to them, though. Christ was revealed to right. them first. True. I, I mean, but when he when he said, "I will put enmity between you and you," and but then then he spoke of the Messiah when he right. said that, that that he will come from your from out of your body or from your seed. Your seed will have enmity against his seed, and his seed will will strike his heel. Mm -hmm. Yet, yet, mm -hmm. yet, yet, the the seed of the Messiah will, will crush his head. Crush his head, right? So, so I really think that that, that at that time, uh, it's very possible that, that that was the first time that somebody was given the vision or given the sight of Messiah. Well, that was another can of worms, you know. Every once in a while, somebody will say something. What's that? I said I love to open up cans of worms. <laughs> I know, uh, but Eric. <laughs> when he said that uh, uh, Adam and Eve couldn't really appreciate it because they had no, no nothing to compare it to. But, but I'm saying now they do. They lived in, in paradise. They, they, they lived after the fall, and, and I'm sure they're looking forward to that being restored again. So now they do have a perspective, whereas when they were living in the garden, there was no perspective for that. And I think that that would have been given to them. Like that was the gift. Even though it was a curse, it was a, it was a gift. And yeah, they would have had to have fallen to really appreciate what they had. So it makes yeah. sense that they had it, they lost it, and then when they got it back, they appreciated it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, he, uh, he says, um, I heard a pastor say on the radio, quote, there's nothing in our present experience that can suggest to us what heaven is like, unquote. But if the eternal heaven will be a new earth, doesn't that suggest that the current earth must be bursting with clues about what heaven will be like? First, let's respond to that pastor's comment. Uh, we've talked about this previously, about the, the view of heaven you get from the pulpit and, and uh, how it's so neglected. But he's saying there's nothing in our present experience that can suggest to us what heaven is like. Oh, oh. Coming from a pastor, does that uh, surprise you? It depends on all what he means exactly, is what I have to say. Because suggested all what heaven is like, I mean, that by those words literally, that's I think is not a true statement, but what I've found kind of frustratingly sometimes is people will state something and mean something completely different. So he could be meaning, for example, that no joy we have compares to the joy there even. Not that it's not an idea of, of like a tiny sample of what it is or something. Well, let me read it again because I, I think you're giving him too much credit. Uh, he says, there's nothing in our present experience that can suggest to us what heaven is like. Yeah, that, 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 the only reason I have to be hyper careful is because I'm always getting in trouble with taking somebody's literal words, thinking that that's the meaning of it, and it turned out it was something completely not what they said, you know. It's yeah. like they have some kind of implicit language that I don't understand. So, yeah. but, but as far as the, what those words literally mean, I really don't know where he gets that, to be honest with you. I mean, it doesn't... Uh, I, I think I know where he gets it. He, he gets it from a shallow concept. 
I really think that he gets it from, well, we don't know what heaven's going to be like because we weren't there. But the, the truth is, is that there, uh, the idea that, that we see earth as a place where we're, we're grasping at utopia, we see, we see on earth the beauty of it, we see on earth uh, uh, we, we have things that we want and we enjoy, but we're frustrated usually, and even if we become multimillionaires and, and get a lot of things that we want, we still have to die. We still have to deal with, with problems in the world. But, yeah. but I think that, that maybe his idea is that nobody's experienced it, so nobody can talk about it. But I, I really think that, that, that it was a shallow, uh, a, a shallow point of view. That's what okay. I think. I, of course, nobody can know for sure what he meant. Because the truth is, is even with the Bible, even with people, I constantly get those all sorts of confusion when I say one sentence, and it's it's very hard. It's almost like we're living in the in, in, where the Tower of Babel, where everybody was confused to begin with. And I really hope that in heaven, when it, people talk, everybody knows exactly what somebody needs. Because it's so much confusion. Yeah. I think the, the Randy Alcorn's initial answer to that man is, is that wait a second, it's called the New Earth. And what we have now is called the Earth. So that alone should tell you that the new Earth is going to be like the Earth, but better. Mm. So that, that, that should tell us a lot right well, there. And then we also have tons of scriptures we're going to be going through that, uh, that we're going to give us much more information. So the scriptures t tell us a lot, and just the fact that it's called the new Earth should tell us a lot. I, I think there are some verses, really good verses, and it, it, as you guys were talking about that, it popped into my head about how people want to totally disassociate earth and life as we know it from any kind of life in heaven. And one of the verses I think that speaks volumes against that, one of one of the series of verses is in Romans chapter 8. And it's verses um, 19 through, um, through 22. And they say, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. So now we're talking about the manifestation. It's, it's talking about us being redeemed and us being glorified and us being put the way we're supposed to be, okay, made the way we're supposed to be. But it says the earnest expectation of the creature. It's talking about created things other than us. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now if the whole creation, the whole creation includes earth, it includes everything that was made that was made in the universe, animals, earth, everything. Okay, If the whole creation groans and travails for a change... Clearly, that same crea creation and those creatures are going to be part of that change, or else why would they travail for something for a change? It doesn't make sense. Maybe this is too much of opening up a can of worms, but it <laughs> seems to me like part of the problem here is um, not a non-literal, non-dispensational view of the Bible. Because then you can keep on saying with all this stuff, well... It says that as a metaphor about the animals. Well, it says this but a metaphor. Metaphor. So you get to the point where there's so many metaphors, it's not even a metaphor for anything anymore. It's a metaphor for another metaphor for another metaphor for another metaphor of what we were what wait what were we talking about kind of thing. Which, which you know you know the funny part about that is that doesn't open a whole new can of worms. That comes back to I think what the pastor was saying, and I think that's why he says what he says. Because th this is what leads to that way of thinking. It, it's yeah. it's just you associate everything with metaphors, everything with symbology, and by doing that, you set yourself up for a fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I think of, of the way that uh, he's going to be uh, explaining this in the book, and that um, is an easy easy way to understand is that uh, I rem I'm 62 years old. And I remember much of my life, I was really very healthy, very vital, and very physically fit, and just really a, a specimen. You know, I mean, I had a great physique, and I was just very athletic, and that was me at my best. And then, as I got older, I became diminished and far less than I was. And I, I now I can, uh, I can say, well, it'll be nice for me to be restored to how I was, but even better. To, in, instead of going mm -hmm. back to my peak, it'll be my peak, but turning me into a, a type of Superman. 
this regenerated, glorified uh, child of God, you know. So in, in that way, uh, not only us, but all of creation is going through that. You know, it was perfect. It was wonderful. The fall happened. It'll all be restored. But once it's restored, it'll be restored even better than mm -hmm. the original. Right. Um, okay. Let's. Uh, he he goes on to say, uh, Scripture gives us images full of hints and impl implications about heaven. Put them together, and these jigsaw pieces form a beautiful picture. For example, uh, we're told that heaven is a city. Uh, Eric, could you look up Hebrews 11, 10, and 13, chapter 13, verse 14? Uh, when we hear the word city, we should, shouldn't scratch our heads and think, I wonder what that means. We understand cities. Cities have buildings, culture, art, music, athletics, goods and services, events of all kinds, and of course cities have people engaged in activities, gatherings, conversations, and work. Uh, so is it is it a correct logical conclusion that when it says refers to the new heaven being a city, this new Jerusalem, uh, that uh, we should know a lot just by the fact that it's called a city? Could you read the verses first, Eric? Sure. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10 states, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And Hebrews 13, 14, chapter 13, verse 14, says, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here we can see there are examples in the scriptures that refer to this eternal heaven, uh, the new heavens, the new earth, being a city. And so if the word city is being used to describe it, do you agree that should get, tell us a lot of, uh, give us a lot of indications of what it's like since we know what cities are like? Yes. It's the whole point behind using that terminology. It's it, Why would he equate it with that? It, it, it's being equated with the best descriptive word we can be given to, to um to relate to us what it is, so we would know it. We would know it as human beings, as a city. That's how we yeah. would know it. Okay, let me ask you another question. You could say uh, the word "city" is used uh, to give us an indication of what it'd be like. Well, yeah, but could it, we also go to the other uh, uh, position that is even stronger and say he used the word "city" because it is actually going to be a city. <laughs> That's why it's called a city. It is a yeah. city, just as we yes. know what a, we know what a city is. And he doesn't say there. He doesn't say neither one of these like a city. He says a city. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Okay. So as he says, heaven is also described as a country in he Hebrews eleven sixteen. Uh, Jackson, can you look that up for us? Which was the reference? Hebrews eleven sixteen. Okay. okay. He says we know about countries. We, they have territories, rulers, national interests, pride uh, in their identity, and citizens who are both diverse and unified. Okay, so what's that verse say? It, it says, but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Very strong on the side of what we've been talking about, too. Yeah. So his Randy's point is when it's, it's referred to as a city, that gives us a lot of information, it, and we know what a city is. When it refers to a country, we know what a country is. So why is there any confusion and speculation? It's we, we, if I told you, hey, there's a city over there, 20 miles north of you. You'll know. You don't say, well, what do you mean a city? What's a city? Can you explain that to me? No, we know what a city is. We know what a country is. Well, it, it, you know, another thing it does, it lends credence to what we've been talking about with the condition of the in intermediate heaven. Because it says here he's already prepared this city. It's prepared. It's already waiting. So this is going to be a physical city. We know it's going to come to the earth and be a physical city. And it's prepared. It's already set in place. I think one of the other reasons here, there's maybe – um. A little play on words there as far as country is concerned. If you go into Revelation, you can actually measure out the dimensions of the city. It actually gives the dimensions. 
and mm-hmm. it's it's enormous. It's miles and miles. <laughs> it's like I think it's something like fourteen hundred miles wide in its base or something like that. We I, I I sat down with my father-in-law one time. We actually did the dimensions. So it's literally the size of a country. It's literally the city itself is as big as what we know as a country. Yeah. The thing the thing that I think is a problem for a lot of people, and obviously this this is illogical. But what I think maybe a reason why somebody might not think it's talking about a physical city is because they wrongly associate something physical with something sinful because the body does call us carnal and everything and these dying decaying bodies and they don't realize there's there could be something as a physical body that does not decay that does not that, that entropy not really existing and stuff right. and yet still have physical qualities and still be a city you know and obviously with zero pollution and everything that you might or zero crime that you might associate with a yeah. city and everything yeah we talked in earlier episodes about this problem of uh, christoplatonism and gnosticism yeah. that, yeah, has, that has us uh, uh, Kind of uh, incorporate, uh, let's say, spread itself in the the belief system of the church that uh, it, sp- physical is bad and spiritual is good. Therefore, heaven and our eternity in heaven has to be all spiritual because physical is bad, and that's just a result from uh, Platonism and, uh, and and Gnosticism. Okay, so he says, uh, if we can't imagine our present earth without rivers, mountains, trees, and flowers, then why would we try to imagine the new earth without these features? We wouldn't expect a uh, non-earth to have mountains and rivers. What's that mean? We wouldn't expect a non-earth... Okay, if it's non-earth to have mountains and rivers, but God doesn't promise us a non-earth. He promised us a new earth. <laughs> okay, so that's that's a play on words. The, mm-hmm. It's not the non-earth, it's the new earth. The new earth. Uh, if the word earth in this phrase means anything, it means that we can expect to find earthly things there, including atmosphere, mountains, water, trees, people, houses, even cities, buildings, and streets. These familiar features are specifically mentioned in chapter, Revelation chapter 21-22. Yeah, I like the. Uh, that was pretty clever, I think, uh, that to, to take the term "new earth" and compare it to the term "non-earth." You know, it's obviously it's called "new earth" because it's going to be the earth uh, remade, like the earth, but better. And it's not going to be made into a non-earth, something that's not earth. <laughs> Uh, he says, we're told we'll have resurrection bodies. Um, Mitch, could you look up 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 through 44? 1 God, Corinthians 15, 40. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 through 44. Uh, when God speaks of us having these bodies, do we shrug our shoulders and say, quote, I can't imagine what a new body would be like? Unquote. No, of course we can imagine it. We know what a body is. We've had one all our lives. And we can remember when our ours looked better, can't we? So we can't imagine a new body. Yeah, I guess that's what I was referring to. <laughs> that's exactly what you're referring to. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first thing I'm going to ask for when we get to the heavens, I'm going to talk to God. So listen, why don't we just take everybody and shrink ourselves down to the size of ants? And then build the city around that. So now we just took a city that was the size of a country and made it the size of a planet. So, but anyway, maybe God will listen to me about this. I have some some suggestions for him about this city. <laughs> well, let me see. By the way, I also want to open up my bank up there. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm taking uh, a savings and loan on Earth, so you can take loans out from heaven. And, yeah, uh, and I'll save. I'll keep your heavenly savings account with my, uh, along with my uh, my other uh, business ventures about heaven. So let us go on to uh, First Corinthians fifteen, <laughs> verses forty to what? Forty four. Uh, verse forty. There, there also, there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory, the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. 
there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for stars differ uh, from uh, uh, for for her star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, and it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Yeah. So here he goes back and forth comparing. It was sown this way, it will be made the new way. Uh, uh, we also talked in a prior episode about this term spiritual body, and I think people greatly misunderstood the term spiritual body. They take it to mean that it's a spirit body. It doesn't have a physical uh, form to it. It's not made of anything physical. It's only spirit. But it doesn't say spirit body, and it doesn't just say spirit it says spiritual body. Spiritual is a, an adjective to describe the type of body. It's, so it's an actual body, but it's spiritual in the sense that it's regenerated. It's, uh, this, uh, it's glorified. It's uh, strange yeah. that people think in their minds that they can't experience, and this is probably going to why this pastor said this, is that they can't I, think of the idea of what it's going to be like to be in heaven because they can't think of the idea of what, it, what even the fish tastes like that Jesus sampled when he was in his resurrection body because they're thinking to themselves that I'm not going to have the ability to sense those things. My, it will be completely different from anything I've ever had. And, you know, I just think of it like, you know, I'm going to smell smells, touch things, uh, 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 experience things, um, you know, flavor um, the, the the gusto of life, enjoyment, and, and and these people who are looking at heaven as if it's some existential weirdness that we're going to have some sort of euphoric feeling, but we're not going to experience anything. No wonder they're out of touch with. They can't yeah. think of what heaven's what going to be like. Yeah. 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 Uh, probably about fifteen twenty minutes ago, he used the term uh, biblical. Yeah. Uh, biblical Christianity, and uh, I have a playlist called Biblical Christianity, because Christianity, as it is described in the Bible, is absolutely different than the, the normal, common viewpoint of what Christianity is, as we as we know. The world, if you ask them to define Christian or Christianity, would be a lot different than what the Bible says Christianity is. So, um, and to me, this idea of looking to, to the Bible for, to see what is Christianity? Who is Jesus Christ? What do we have to do to be saved? What will heaven be like? This, these are the biblical answers that we're, going, we're, we're using, uh, not just man's ideas and, and theories. We're just, what's the Bible say about it? And it does say a lot. Um, okay, so... Uh, uh, he says, in heaven we'll rest. Uh, Eric, could you see, look up that Revelation 14, 13? We know what it means to rest, and we want to rest. Uh, Jackson, you look up Hebrews 4, verses 10 and 11. We're, we're told we will serve Christ on the new earth, working for his glory. Uh, Mitch, could you look up Revelation 22, 3? One, two, three, okay. Yeah. We know what it means to work, and we want to work. So it's talking about a, we're going to work and we're going to rest uh, in, in eternity. So let's start. Who was the first one? Uh, Revelation 14, 13. Okay. It says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Okay. For not only do you have rest, and we know what rest means. Uh, actually, most of the Christians, Christians don't really know what rest means in terms of salvation. And that's just resting in, in, in your faith in Jesus and not worrying about your salvation because it's already settled. Jesus saved you. But this is talking about just like a physical type of rest because it says labors. 
you know, uh, if you have labor, you eventually get tired and you want to rest. So we're going to actually have rest. And, and uh, what was the next one, uh, Jackson? Yeah, Hebrews 4, 10, and 11. It says, for that, or sorry, for he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Yeah. Now, in this verse, I would think that this type of rest is what I was referring to in resting in, in your faith in Jesus. Rather than the first one, I thought it was more about talking about labors. You know, you're working hard. Well, okay, take a break and rest. Don't just work all the time. You need to rest too. And uh, Mitch? Uh, what was that, verse 4 or 3? Verse 3. And there shall uh, no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his bondservants shall serve him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's talking about working. Serving, working, you know, you probably have the word work if you used a different translation there. And so the idea of in eternity, we are his bond servants and we're going to be working. We're going to have a job. Uh, but it's not a, I don't think it's going to be a job like, if you think of a job you'd like to do, um, and then you also think of another job, oh, I would never want to do that. I don't think we're going to be given jobs that we hate, that are drudgery. Um, Someone, a friend of mine says he hasn't worked a, a, a day for the last 40 years. It's not because he retired. It's because he loves his job so much, It's not he doesn't consider it work. He just loves to do it. And I think these are the kinds of jobs, these are the kinds of work that we'll be doing in eternity. We'll be busy working, and uh, God has uh, some plan for us to, to do things in eternity. I'm really curious to find out what it is. Okay, now he says, Scripture speaks of a new Jerusalem made of precious stones. Some of the jewels listed in Revelation 21, 19 through 21 are among the hardest substances known. Uh, they indicate the material, material solid solidity of the new earth. Eric, can you find Revelation 21, sure. 19 through 21? And it says, um, And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, and the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, and the ninth topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, and the twelfth an amethyst. The, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Yeah. You did a good job reading those. Some of those kind of hard to pronounce. <laughs> uh, but the point Randy's making here is that this is describing a physical reality. These are hard, hardest stones. And, and that uh, also they're they're beautiful. Uh, these are precious stones, much of them, and, and they're. Um, it certainly doesn't describe some um, ethereal place. It's a physical place. Same sounds really beautiful. And you got those pearly gates too. That's <laughs> if anybody ever talks about the pearly gates. Is that in the Bible? Yeah, you just heard it. <laughs> Uh, it says, the problem is not that the Bible doesn't tell us much about heaven. It's that we don't pay attention to what it tells us. Isn't that amazing? Uh, there really is. As we go through this book, uh, if anybody who watches this whole series, they're, they're going to just be amazed at how much the scriptures say about heaven. It's just that kind of, for some reason, even myself, all the years I've studied the Bible, uh, I never really... Put it all together. It's a, as he referred to it as a jigsaw puzzle before, but there's there's hundreds of references to give us ideas of things in heaven, and uh, but it's a bit here and a bit there and a bit here and a bit there, and now he puts it all together in this book so that we it's cohesive and we get a real good picture of heaven. 
He says, some of the best portrayals I've seen on the eternal heaven are in children's books. Mitch, you like that? Children's, I love children's books. Yeah. What was your favorite Bible, Mitch? Of my children's Bible. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that a children's book on heaven and a children's Bible are the best? And, and that's because they don't make it complicated. They don't try to explain some surreal right. thing of heaven. And, and, and the children's book telling you about the Bible and, and Jesus and how to get saved, it just tells you in the simplest way like so a little child can understand. He says, uh, because they depict earthly scenes with animals and people playing and joyful activities, the books for adults, on the other hand, often try to be philosophical, profound, ethereal, and otherworldly. But that kind of heaven is precisely what the Bible doesn't portray as the place where we'll live forever. So anybody who's watching this, if you want to read a book about heaven, you know, uh, uh, you know, don't get the adult books. Go to get the children's section and get the little ones with pictures and stuff, and you'll really get a better indication of what heaven's going to be like. <laughs> That's really amazing. I'm going to go to page 80. He says, Abraham, quote, was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God, unquote. That's Hebrews 11.10. If he was looking forward to it, don't you think he was imagining what it would be like? Abraham's descendants, quote, were longing for a better country, a heavenly one, unquote. That's 11, or Hebrews 11, 16. And as Christ followers, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come, Hebrews 13, 14. We are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised, 2 Peter. So, Yeah. We just keep on getting more. There's, there's so much uh, description in the scriptures about heaven. Um, he says, he asked this next question. Is the eternal heaven an actual place? Well, I think from what we've discovered so far, everybody should already know, know that, but it's amazing how many people do not think of it as a place. Uh, even this uh, temporary, uh, this intermediate heaven, I, I think that most people would not identify it as a place. I know there was one Bible teacher I read quite a bit that he actually believed that he knew the, the location of heaven in the universe. And he said it was uh, out in the, uh, go to the North Star, it's out there. Because there's something in scriptures that refers to the North or the North Star. Uh, but uh, the, the, Heaven that we uh, are in right now, the eternal, um, I mean, the, the intermediate heaven, and then the new heaven and the new earth, will, it will have locality. It will have a location. It will be a place. Many people can't resist spiritualizing what the Bible teaches about heaven. According to an evangel evangelical theologian, quote, while heaven is both a place and a state, it is primarily a state. <laughs> But what does this mean? Is any other place primarily a state? How Depends you... on where you look at state. I look at New Jersey as a state. <laughs> yeah, but uh, he's thinking, using the word state as in a, a type of uh, existence. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Of course. State right, of, of course. mind, state of existence. Right. It depends on, like I said, it depends on how you define state. But yeah. um, I just kind of took that that way. I don't know why. But I, I knew what it was saying. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I really think that this is the, the go ahead the, the big the big misnomer with everything that, that people look at things existentially that they, they they don't look at things are are, are, are straightforward. Well, I yeah. think too that they confuse one with the other and and think they're mutually exclusive. Like we will be in a different state in heaven. We'll be sinless. We won't have our sin natures. We'll be benevolent. We'll actually be good there and everything. But that doesn't mean that heaven is a, is is a place or is, is sorry is a state. It means that it is a place, and that we're, while we're in that place, we're in that state. Yeah. Yes. 
Here's here's something interesting. I always love when they bring up you know evangelical a theologian, which never really impresses me. I, people can call themselves yeah. theologians all they want. I've seen theologians come up with a lot of bad bad stuff. <laughs> So your, your your qualifications of theologian doesn't mean diddly squat as far as I'm concerned. So when a person makes a comment, it's just as wrong for him to make the comment. While heaven is both a place and a state, it is primarily a state. Well, have you been there? You know, the question has been put to us, well, have you been there? Well, no, we haven't been there, but neither have you. So for you to emphatically say, well, it's primarily a state, that's very presumptuous on your part. You know, there's a, there's a great line in Scripture. It says, seek and ye shall find, knock, and the door will be open to you. You know, conversely, if you don't seek, you're not going to find. Okay, so if you have no desire to learn what heaven is about, or you simply write it off, guess what? God's not going to give you gleanings of knowledge about it. He's not going to to reward you with that. The reason why I think we're having such a positive thing that we're doing with this study and, and with what we're doing here is because we are seeking this. We want to know. We desire to know. We're following Scripture when it says, seek and you will find. We want to know more about heaven. So God is going to give us little gleanings about it and say, okay, well then I, here and there I'm going to show you a little bit. I'm going to show you the way to, to see a little bit about that and know a little bit about it. If you don't seek, of course you're not going to find. Eric, I, I really think that your problem here is that you're not from the state of theologians. The state well, you know, theology. I want to I actually... Where's that located? I want to... I um, <laughs> Somewhere up in your near, head. Is that near Bolivia? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to get that if they didn't see the last video. The, the, the thing Bolivia. here, too, is that not only does theologian not impress me, but uh, anymore the title evangelical doesn't even impress me. Anymore. Oh, yeah, I, I think, I think because you're right. I agree. Here's the thing, to me, that should be something like the evangelical, like evangelism and the gospel, that certainly should be something that we can sure. say that we're united in. And I'm not saying I'm not an evangelical Christian, but I'm sorry, but if John MacArthur and James White and all these liberal universalist people, too, are evangelical, so they all put that in the title and everything, that title no longer impresses me either. Well, I think they put the title doctor in there, too. Don't they throw doctor of theology? Oh, sh oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I have, a, I have a, a, a doctorate in evangelical theology. Yeah. <laughs> theology. Yeah. Theology, right. <laughs> well, I guess uh, we're, all, we're all in agreement that uh, none of the four of us are really very impressed with these theological credentials. You know, people who go to seminary and, and then right. end up graduating and they have a bunch of letters and stuff after their name. And, uh, it's sad to say this, but uh, many of the seminaries and most of the people coming out of those, those seminaries are uh, uh, really... I've been greatly disappointed in what they, their conclusions about scriptures and, and Christianity. They're so far off of what we can see is very clear. It's just in black and white as plain as day. Uh, and, and then they, they want to try to spiritualize things and allegorize things and, and uh, even uh, say that things like uh, Adam and Eve is just a, a fable. It's just a story. It's not, there wasn't a real event, you know. Things like that. This is what you get from these people with all the letters behind their names. Yep. And the thing, and and the thing is, you don't have to look. It doesn't have to be complicated. You can you can refute them on basic fundamental principles that you like. You said that are black and white, right there in scripture, for anybody to read and understand. And they'll take and completely contort these things into something that they're not. Again, Eric, I have to say that you're wrong about that, because of course, because I have the the, the letters in front of my name. Yeah. I'm absolutely right. And what, an letters, what letters do you have in front of your OG, right? <laughs> well, which letters, though? That's the question. Uh, <laughs> you are... Okay, here... You You're, are wrong. You are wrong. I, are wrong, I, right? I am right. Yeah. <laughs> I am right. Okay, uh, here's another example of something coming from, from the mouth of a theologian. Quote, Paul does not think of heaven as a place, but thinks of it in terms of the presence of God, unquote. And Randy Alcorn says, but when a person is, quote, present, unquote, doesn't that suggest there's a place? <laughs> that, that's so weird to me. That all, you know what I picture with whoever wrote that statement? I picture us just floating around or whatever. It's like, oh, with God right there and just floating. And it's like, yes. maybe, maybe it's just like a black background or white background or I don't know. 
and they're just <laughs> floating, and we're because we're, all we are is in the presence of God. There's no place to do anything or whatever. You know, you know what this is. This is I tell you exactly what this is. This is, and this goes back to what Mitch was saying. <sighs> Mitch was talking about how people feel like they got to have this need to be existential. They got, they, 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 feel, they got. It's this desire of people to feel like they got to be deep. I got to be deep, and you can't understand me, and you can't. You know, I, I'm so deep in my mind and so deep into what I'm doing that you can't possibly fathom the kind of things that I'm considering. You know, so they have this desire to be like that, and. You know, most of humanity doesn't realize that as human beings, we're about as deep as a puddle. Okay, we're not deep. Okay, we're, we all have the same problems. We all have the same issues. So it, it's yeah. a desire for more meaning in your life, which actually should be coming from God. It should be coming from the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And don't Christ. you ever think that you'll ever be able to understand what I'm talking about because of the letters in front of my name? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what if what if you also get letters is the thing and disagree because that's the other thing too is like there's always like some and we'll, we'll we'll even use a non spiritual realm example there's always some doctor that recommends some diet and another doctor <laughs> who disagrees with that diet well you can give me a letter give me an A. Yeah. You know well, what I'm saying? Well, that, well, yeah, well, wait, wait, wait. How, how about the nine out of ten doctors that always recommend a toothbrush? Maybe number not, number number ten was right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the other nine weren't wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, toothbrushes. Well, I don't. I don't. I don't believe in them. You don't believe in a toothbrush? Are they, well, are they, are they a thin toothbrushes? Well, I just think that the toothbrushes that they make now are made out of estrogen plastic. Why am I sticking plastic in my mouth? Now give me a wood. I use a wood uh, uh, piece of wood actually, or I, I, you know, or baking soda or whatnot. I don't put toothpaste with fluoride in my mouth. Mm -hmm. is, is that an issue we have to be dogmatic about as Christians? What <laughs> you think, use yes, to write down the doctrinal statement? Well, we I think I mean, we have to refer to Mitch's credentials, right? We have to refer to Mitch's credentials. You can't understand this stuff. You must <laughs> come under submission because of the letters in front of my name. I'm, I'm going to have to say something because if anybody watching this, I don't want anybody to uh, blame the panel for what Mitch is saying here about using wood on your teeth, and, you know, or don't use a br if you really want your teeth clean, don't use don't a Brillo. Don't try this at home. Don't use a Brillo pad. Yeah. Do, not not use a, do not use a loofah on your teeth. <laughs> okay, now he says um, one book places the word, uh, one book puts uh, the word place in quotation marks whenever it uses the word to describe heaven or hell. It says, paradise is, quote, a spiritual condition more than a spatial location, unquote. <laughs> Jesus didn't say that heaven was primarily a state or a spiritual condition. He spoke of a house with many rooms in which he would prepare a place for us. In, in Revelation, the, uh, the new earth, and the New Jerusalem are portrayed as places with detailed physical descriptions. Yeah. Uh, oh, Jesus. You know what? There's an interesting thing you pointed out there, Luke. And it's the first time he's talked about it in a while. We were usually talking about heaven here, but there's that other H word that came into play, hell. And I just something just popped into my head, and that is, you know, maybe this is more about hell than it is about heaven for people. Because if you can talk yourself into believing that hell's not a real place, it becomes less of a non-attractive place to go. You know, so if you can start saying, "Well, heaven and hell are both spiritual. They're not really. They're 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 symbolic and they're they're um they're not real." Well, then that makes hell not such a bad place to wind up. You know, because it's, it's a not state. A good place. It, 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 yeah, right. Exactly. And heaven, that's a good place. But it brings down heaven. To bring up hell a little bit, almost. I'm not saying that's the case, but I wonder. I wonder if that's got a little something to do with it. Yeah, it well, makes me really think about the, my business venture here: an ice bar in hell. An ice bar, a snowball yeah, stand. Yeah, called uh, hell freezes over. Ice bar. Well, you know what they say about a snowball's chance. You know, that's what they, that's the saying. You know. <laughs> It, uh, he says, uh, Jesus told the disciples, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. That's uh, John 14, 3. He uses ordinary earthly spatial terms to describe heaven. The word where refers to a place, a location. Likewise, the phrase come back and take you indicates movement and a physical destination. 
if heaven isn't a place, would Jesus have said it was? If we reduce heaven to something less than or, or other than a place, we strip Christ's words of their meaning. Wow. That's, uh, that's to me, uh, uh, not only in this conversation, but in, in many other topics I've uh, had with, discussed with people, is all we got to do is, do you believe what Jesus said or not? For example, uh, they ask the question, do you, think, uh, do you think that if you're not a Christian, you're not going to go to heaven, you'll go to hell? Uh, do you think people who aren't Christians, they're all going to go to hell? And I said, well, I believe the Bible. I believe the words of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So are we going to believe the words of Jesus when he says he's the only way to get to heaven? Are we going to believe the words of Jesus when he says heaven is a place? He's building, he's preparing a place for us. He's going to take us there. Or are we going to say, no, Jesus, uh, he misspoke. <laughs> oh, he misspoke. Like Barack Obama misspoke, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, what is that? What savior. Is but doesn't that just start to make the Bible – it just makes it so much more confusing because anybody trying to understand it, you can say that about anything he said, about anything you want at that point. You can start changing it so that you can – any any place he said where place didn't mean actual place. I mean you could literally go through scripture and change the meanings of words all through it, and then it's well, never that, really that, understandable to anybody because you just – And that's exactly, and that's exactly what people do, Eric, I would argue. For example – you have people out there saying Jesus didn't die for the whole world, that he only died for the elect. And I did a little study on that. I just, I don't know how anyone believes that with 1 John 2 2, with John 3 16. There's another verse in Timothy, but I just, I don't know how somebody can think that the Bible teaches that Christ only died for certain people, and yet there are plenty of people with letters before and after their name, like we were talking about, who emphatically teach this and believe this. Yep. And Okay, uh, so now the world knows what we think of the theologians, uh, all the people who uh, the great educations from the great seminaries. Uh, sadly, uh, very few of them do we hold in very high esteem. But we do hold some, like Dr. Curtis sure. Hudson. Yeah, sure. yeah, there there are some, uh, but unfortunately, I think the vast majority of of those people. Uh, that are have the theological degrees and, and and the vast majority of the seminaries that they attend are very liberal and they do not take the scriptures uh, literally and they want to well, allegorize well, I it. Think, you know, I think you also have happening in the seminaries now in places like that um, the same thing that's happening in all other places like science and other other places of um, of learning is it's an intimidation thing you know you have to go with the mainstream or else you're not going to be accepted so you can't really speak up or else you don't get your Credentials. You don't get, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Randy Alcorn asks us hundreds of questions about heaven. And the next question he asks is Are we just a passing through? Are we just a passing through? Uh, he says, The old gospel song, quote, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, unquote, is a half truth. We may pass from the earth through death, but eventually we'll be back to live on the restored earth. Um, earth has been damaged by our sins. That's in Genesis 3.17. Therefore, the earth as it is now under the curse is not our home. But the world as it was and as it will be is our home. We have never known a world without sin, suffering, and death, yet we yearn for such a life and such a world. When we see a roaring waterfall, beautiful flowers, and a wild animal in its native habitat, or the joy in the eyes of our pets when we see they see us, we sense that this world is, or at least was meant to be, our home. So, uh, you know, I've often, you know, I guess I've, I've been guilty to an extent of kind of misapplying terms like that, too. I'm a pilgrim passing through, uh, and, uh, you know, my, 
uh, I yearn for a better country, you know, and all, all that. But, but, uh, uh, and uh, I think it I'm, I'm, I'm just passing through this world. This is not my real home. But yet, and, and it's because I'm not satisfied. As much as I can see beauty in this world, I'm not satisfied in this fallen state with my individual condition, my body, my, my, what I deal with, and also what I see in the, this fallen world. I'm not satisfied with it, so I don't. I know this is not my home, my final destination. Uh, so I want to. I want to make the best of it while I'm here, because there is a lot of beauty. Look at our friendship right here. I, I really love this friendship and fellowship that we have. There is a lot of beauty and, and great things to be um, enjoyed in this world, even in a fallen state. But we know uh, this is not the uh, the ultimate. This is just a, a a little little shadow of our what the wonders of we have to look forward to. Well, I think it totally depends on what you mean by world in this case too, because it, that can be referred to all people and society. I mean, it doesn't say this planet is not my home. I'm just a passing to, through because that that seems to refer to the to me the physical layout, etc. But yeah, the yeah. world is often used just to turn to describe the culture and everything too. Yeah, that's a good point. Look, when people I think have problems with the world, they aren't usually talking about problems in nature or something like that. There's like but even even in some of the more um, more current songs, I think I, I agree with Luke. Though. I mean, I, I think that, and I agree with what he's saying here. They do kind of insinuate it's the place. We, we're kind of they kind of disassociate this place entirely from where we're headed, as if. It'll be over here, and we never have to ever be back here again. And this place isn't really where my home is. I go to be in my home in heaven. That's where I'm going to stay. And then there's not really. They don't really. You know what I mean? I, I think. I think most people accept that that's what those lines mean. When you say something like that, that that's what they generally accept. Mm -hmm. uh, he says uh, we are pilgrims in this life, not because our home will never be on earth, but because our eternal home is not currently on earth. Uh, it was and it will be, but it's not now. Will the Eden we long for return? Will it be occupied by familiar, tangible, physical features and fully embodied people? The Bible clearly answers yes. So, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of these things that, uh, that we, in this discussion group here, we are aware of because of our years of studying the scriptures, uh, and yet then there's a lot that uh, you know that I've learned from reading his book and looking at this more closely. But when you look at the Christianity as a whole, uh, I, I think that very few people really have any clue about anything we've talked about. In in already ten, in eleven and hours and twenty minutes, we talked about heaven. And, and I think the vast majority of Christians have probably, maybe, don't even know 90% of anything we've discussed. That's that's such negligence in the church. No, I, I think it's reminiscent of something different. I think it's reminiscent of the idea that their idea, their 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 focus is that not in the world to come, but their focus is in this world. Mm -hmm. That their focus is is, uh, is is the same focus of the rest of the world. They're lovers of this world, and they don't really want to think or can think about heaven. They talk about it, but the, what most Christians I think are striving for, or they call themselves Christians, is a utopia here on earth. Which, when they sinned in the garden and they ate of this fruit, they were they were thrown into a world that's going to fall apart, and yet they're still trying to salvage it. And make it utopia here. I really think that, that that they might not say that, but I really think that 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 may, may be the mindset of most Christianity is to is to make this place and to look sort of like when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Lot's Lot's wife looked back. Mm -hmm. What was she looking at? This world. Mm -hmm. Now I really think that most of Christianity isn't Christianity because it's not looking at heaven at all. And maybe that's why there's so few, when you talk about there's the, the 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 road being narrow and the way being the path being small, you know, these people may be on the on the wide road, 
and not even know it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you know what? Both of those things, I think, are they are both the worst combinations of the reasons why. You're both absolutely correct. And I, I experienced that whenever I discuss with you just you try to discuss with a lot of Christians today the idea of the rapture, which should be our glorious our hope, our blessed hope. The, you know, that moment where all this comes to fruition, where we where redemption happens, it actually happens for us, and they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to talk about it. It's ridiculousness to them. I mean, it, it doesn't that isn't that very telling of what just what Mitch was saying right there? It, it's this idea that now, 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 don't worry about any of that. We got we got to make everything down here perfect, and we got to make a utopia down here. You, you're not going to be whisked away and taken away because with down here, we got to make it work down here. And it's like it's like they can't even see the world around them and what's happening around them. It's like where do you think that we're going to go right suddenly? We're, we're suddenly going to make this 180 degree turn and everything's going to go right. <laughs> Well, it's not gonna. It's not gonna happen, folks. It's not gonna happen. Okay, it's not. That's not realism. It's it's not the real world. Okay. What, 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 what's interesting about that too, Eric, is if you ever remember, I think it was a Beatles song. Imagine there's no heaven. Yeah. However, notice how the very first line is not "Imagine there's no hell." It's "Imagine, right. it's imagine no heaven. there's no heaven." Yeah. It's this desire to to don't worry about that. We're, we we can make a perfect place here. Mm-hmm. No, no, you can't, folks. Mm-hmm. You can't. <laughs> yeah. And he said, imagine there is no religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, uh, I've made a video called Religion, the Opiate of the Masses, mm-hmm. because the way I use the word religion is um, uh, the re- all the religions of the world are all really the same. And they're telling you, you've got to work your way to heaven. You've got to, you've got to perform. And if you perform well enough, you become a good enough person, you may be able to qualify for heaven. That's, right. that's all the religions of the world. Well, that's why my business is doing so well. Mitch and Sackloff, mm-hmm. you know, where you just pay me and I'll repent for you. Yeah. Well, um, Mitch, I appreciate what you're doing, uh, doing all that good works for everybody and all that and making good for, money for other, other people. But, but that's the difference in Christianity. Real biblical Christianity is Jesus already did it all for us. He already paid for it. No, no, don't tell him that. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to make him ruin my business. Listen, everybody, you don't have to send your money to Mitch. So no, he hey, 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 uh, but my point about uh, when the Beatles song says, imagine there's no religion, well, I would love for there to be no religion in the world either, but my definition of religion is is uh, everything out par- out apart from biblical Christianity is religion. Right. That's believing in man's ability to solve the problem himself. Uh, Christianity is saying men cannot solve the problem. We need uh, to be saved, and Jesus is the Savior. So... Um, uh, imagine those religion. Yeah, I'd love to have the no religion. Just everybody put their faith in the Savior instead. But the Beatles in their song, I think they are basically just, even including Jesus and the Bible and all that stuff. Imagine all that stuff's gone. You know, uh, right? Oh, it's it's classic Chomsky. It's our classic yeah. uh, um, uh, Marxism. That's I mean, that, and, and, and that is exactly what they mean. I mean, it, it is it is uh, create a problem, <clears throat> which is religion. Well, religion is a created problem by Satan, right? Then take the problem and and offer the solution, which is eliminate what you call the problem is when they cause the problem to begin with and then take over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when they say imagine there's no heaven, they really say stop thinking about eternity and being able to go to heaven. Think about making earth heaven. Let's make the best of what we can right now. Let's make this earth into our heaven and enjoy it for 80 years as long as we get because there's no afterlife. There's no heaven to look forward to. Sounds like the garden to me. Yeah. Eating of the fruit. Let's eat the fruit. Now, I, I'm not sure this is going to work, but I'm going to try to, on page 82, Eric, it, he begins this chart, uh, and, and he compares three errors of mankind. We're going to go through this point by point brief, quickly, and I just want to get your reaction to each of these points. But basically, Randy Alcorn is saying that uh, the first two books of the Bible, I mean the first two chapters of the Bible, uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, um, explains the past situation before the fall of man. And, and then Genesis chapter 3 all the way up to Revelation 20 
talks about this present condition that of, of the fall of man's fall and the fallen state of, of, of the world. And then starting in Reve Revelation chapter 21 and 22 talks about this future eternal condition that we have to look forward to. So basically, if anybody's studying the Bible, you need to look at uh, Genesis chapter chapter 1 and 2 as before the fall. That was the, what man was, uh, the state of man and the earth. And then Genesis chapter 3 versus Revelation chapter 20. That's what uh, we've been dealing with ever since the fall. And then Revelation 21 and 22, that's the future, what we have to look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. And then it goes point by point and talks about these different uh, subjects, how they, how they apply in these three eras of history. And he, first he says, uh, original mankind, what man was like in the garden. And, th and then, then we got the state we're in now, fallen man, and then out of all the history of fallen man, you have this small group of people who put their faith in God to save them. And since the cross, we put our faith in Jesus, this God, his name, Jesus Christ. We put our faith in him. So we have some of us who believe in God's salvation and, and we're transformed as a child of God. And then in the future, you have the resurrected mankind. What, and, and these resurrected people, uh, uh, we're going to be spending eternity in that in that uh, eternal new heaven, new earth. So, uh, first of all, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with these particular sections of the Bible as far as how he's narrowed it down, but uh, what do you think of that so far? The original state of man, uh, and then the, the fallen man today with some of us who are saved, and then in the future, the resurrected resurrection of all mankind. When we think about the resurrection, I think, especially the resurrection of the body, I think of when when when, um, when Elijah was taken up with a whole body. Where did his body go? If he had a body when he was taken up in a chariot, did they all of a sudden get rid of his body? I mean, why did they even have to take it? You know, but but in a new heaven and in a new earth. Um, being a paradise before, then a paradise lost, and then a paradise rebuilt. Um, he put Adam and Eve in the garden to tend the garden. So imagine what happens when we've got a new heaven and a new earth with a whole bunch of people up there gardening and building and, and, and bustling around. Adam has an awful lot more helpers now. He's got all the children of Israel or all the, or all the, or all the people. So, so I think that it's going to be an awful lot like the like a Garden of Eden, but I think that there's going to be an awful lot more people running around, kind of working at the zoo, working here, working, doing the, a whole bunch of things that that Adam was doing alone. Of course, I guess he didn't have a problem with, but I, I do see it as a, as a bustling place with with with, with uh, that's just as beautiful and with with us building like bridges and and doing architectural yeah. things. Enjoy it. Thanks. Okay, uh, and then also then he talks about the earth itself. You had the, in Genesis chapter one and two it had the original earth, and now we have earth in this fallen state with a, a, a glimmer, a glimmer of the original. In other words, the wonders of earth and the wonders of Adam and Eve, the, the condition. We still have a glimmer of that, and that's why there's still some beauty in this world, and there's still some some things to be happy about and celebrate. But it's only a, a little glimmers of the original, and then we got the new resurrected Earth. To me, I think, for me personally, I think the way he breaks this down, he calls it the three eras of mankind and the Earth. It's crucial to break it down like this as a history. The Bible is not just a fanciful book of stories the way people want you to believe. It's a history. It's a history and prophecy. It's telling before. It's telling what's going on. It's telling what's going to come. Okay. If you take away one part of that, the whole thing falls apart, and, you can, and you'll never be able to make the other parts make sense. If you eliminate what we talked about, you talked about the theologians who eliminate what he talks about the past section. You talk about original mankind, original earth as being past. You eliminate that. 
and it's not part of history, it's not the past, well, you've got nothing to base that on. There's no basis, there's no foundation, so it really makes everything else interpreted any other way you want to say it because you've got no basis for it. There's no foundation. And, and what, is, what does Christ tell us about foundations? Foundations are the most important piece of anything. You know, the Genesis in, isn't in there. And what God tells us about past before the fall is not in there for an entertaining tale or a story. It's a foundation. It's the whole foundation, and pre- it, it, everything else comes together with this. It shows that physical things are not bad just because they're physical. God made things in their original state as physical. They weren't bad. They were good. If you eliminate that, like you talk about with Gnosticism, the Platonism, you eliminate that. Oh, these are actual just fables and fanciful stories. Well, then you eliminate that, and you don't. And and then it is all symbology, and it's not. It's not true. So there's an advantage to doing that for those people to do that. It, I think it's crucial that people see the progression of history through the scripture. And I really liked this time, this this timeline thing he did because I think it makes it it really comes to life, and you you see the you see the purpose, the point. It gives you purpose to the end. Yeah. So as we go through these different topics, he's divided into these three uh, eras. Uh, you got uh, the past. Uh, the the original condition, and then we have the current, the present, the current condition, and then we have the future restored conditions. You have paradise, paradise lost, and then paradise restored. Mm -hmm. So he's got mankind, the original condition of man, the fallen condition of man, and then the resurrection, resurrected condition of man. He's got the original earth, and then he's got the fallen earth, and then he's got the new earth, and next he has God delegates, in the, in the past, God delegates reign. That's uh, R-E-I-G-N, reign, to innocent mankind. And then in the present, uh, this disputed reign with God, Satan, and fallen mankind. And then in the future, God delegates reign to righteous mankind. I'm interested in what you have to say about this present state where he says, uh, in the present state, disputed reign with God, Satan, and fallen mankind. I heard it put really well as far as, I, as, far as I'm concerned. I don't know how the, uh, how the other guys feel, but I've heard this put re- really well. When God created all this originally, God delegates the reign to innocent mankind. He creates all of creation. Now, remember that. All of creation. We're not just talking about Earth. We're talking about the expanses past Earth. We're talking about all of creation. And he gives this to man and says, here's the deed. Okay? You stay obedient to me. You do what I ask you to do and not do this one thing I ask you to do. The deed is yours. Populate the Earth. Name the animals. Enjoy this creation that I've made for you. And we're going to have this wonderful future together. What man essentially does is when he rebels against God, he takes the deed and he hands it over to Satan. He says, here's the deed. I'm giving you the deed because I trusted you more than I trusted God. And it's taken out of his hands. So there's, the, to me, the disputed reign. And Christ, what he does is he, snatches, he takes the deed back. His victory takes the deed back, and then that, that's going to be handed back to man through his righteousness, through what, what he does to correct that problem that man caused. Yes. Well, um, the word reign, R-E-I-G-N, um, could also, I get another words for that, like maybe governing. Mm-hmm. Rule. If you're reigning, you're governing. Mm-hmm. So God originally made Adam and Eve in charge, mm-hmm. and, and now... Now there's a dispute, between, uh, present tense, there's a dispute, a battle for control between God, Satan, and fallen mankind. And mankind, fallen man, he wants to be in charge. He wants to be reign over the earth. Mm-hmm. And, and, but in the future, we will, uh, the uh, righteous mankind, we will be uh, given uh, reign over the earth again. And then uh, the next subject he says is man uh, in the past mankind was given dominion w- with intended stewardship of the earth and then present tense mankind's dominion is thwarted and frustrated and twisted and in the future mankind's dominion will be fulfilled redeemed stewardship of the earth huh sounds like a prodigal story to me What's happened here is that first man was under the authority of God. 
then man threw the authority of God off for the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and so wanted to create a, a, a reign of man taking over. Man didn't know what he was doing to begin with. This also Satan, who, who, who put everything on, basically took over everything, was giving the fruit of Satan saying, well, we can take over this place, or, you know, you don't need a God to reign over you. Rebellion against God, out of grace, under law, then one came to take the law away and bring you back to the point where you're now back serving the one that was good to you instead of you trying to do something that you can't even measure up to your own law. So it, it comes full here. It starts off with man being in his place and then given this idea that he can do a better job and then finding out that he fails miserably and then being offered redemption and now coming back under a reign where man actually is happy to and knows what he lost live for in the love of God whereas before he couldn't understand what that was all about. Mm. Okay, we got the next point he makes is the three uh, eras where, where God is. He says, in the past, God's in heaven and spent time with man on earth, visiting man on earth in the garden. Presently, God's in heaven. He's separate yet active. He indwells believers by the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then in the future, God will be living forever with mankind on the new earth. So you can see in the past, God was on earth with Adam and Eve. In the future, God will be with us in the new heaven and earth. But right now, there's this uh, barrier between man and God. Jesus paid for sin, but the only way man can have a relationship is through this indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We, get, we, get, uh, we become a child of God once we put our faith in Jesus as our Savior. So you've got uh, God was with man, then God was separated from man, and right now it's possible to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ if you'll if you put your faith in Him now, uh, and in the future, uh, God will be living with us on the earth again in person. He says, in the past uh, there was no curse, universal perfection and blessing. Presently. Uh, Sin and the curse, that's the withdrawal of blessing or blessings and selectively given, plus common grace. And then uh, in the future, no more curse, greater blessing, deeper perfection, grace unending. So you had no curse, and now we have a curse. And then in the future, there'll be no curse. Now about shame. Uh, in the past, uh, with Adam and Eve, there was no shame until the fall. And now man lives in shame. Uh, and, of course, we don't need to be ashamed if we put our faith in the Savior. We're restored. And then in the, in the future, no shame or potential for shame. You can't. You can't even have any shame. Uh, there's no p possibility of even having any shame in the in the new heavens and new earth. Well, that's why Christianity today has to make you live in shame constantly. You, you're not going to get any in, in heaven, so you have to live in shame and in sorrow all the time. It's very important in your Christianity to live shamefully because this is the way Christianity is set up today, to live in shame. Well, it's not assurance. What's that? In the shame. Lack exactly. of assurance. And no assurance. There you go. No assurance and in shame. This is mainstream Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know um, if you've watched some of Mitch's recent videos, he's, he's actually spent a lot of time talking about this, uh, this, 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 you should be ashamed, you should have contrition, you should shed tears, you should have a broken heart and be so sad over and repentant over your, your sins. And, and that's not what the Bible says to us at all. As Christians, we don't need, there's no need for any more shame or contrition or tears or anything else. We should be just happy because Jesus did it all for us. And, and uh, but, 
But if you do feel like you want to have shame and contrition and tears, Mitch is volunteering to shed tears for you for thirty nine ninety five a month. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and I'll do I'll do a good job. I will. I'll I'll, I'll really try. And I'll put on sackcloth and and I'll sprinkle ashes on my head. And I'll, I'll repent really hard for you. I'll do a good job. I, I think the, the shame that Mitch is talking about is directly related to what, what I mentioned, which is the lack of assurance. Sure it is. Because, because if you have guilt and shame, that means that your sins weren't taken away. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it begs the question. It's like if you're living in shame and tears and, and you know, anguish over yourself, where, where's the victory in that? Well, you know, are, aren't aren't we on the victorious team? Or aren't we the servants we're of the super victor? Super overcomers. Super. We're, 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 we're the servants of the victor. He's already won the battle. The battle's won. It's done. We, it's no, over. no, you got to overcome by shame. <laughs> yeah, you, overcome you, by you shame. Have, if you're shameful yeah. enough and repentant enough, that's overcoming. But you don't know if you are until the end, of course. Exactly. So just be, <laughs> that's why you got to pay me because yeah. I'll do the job. I mean, because. Because, well, and I need to ask Mitch because this is his whole spiel. It's his whole thing. So how shameful do I need to be? I mean, well, yeah, I, well, well what is my level of shame? a month, I'll, I'll make sure that I'm shameful enough. Now, now, how can I be certain that you're delivering the kind this of shame that I really... This is my guarantee. <laughs> here's the thing, too. I mean... Here's the thing, too. I, I, in, the video I, in the video I uploaded about the overcomers by Tom Stiegel, there's a really um, interesting thing when you talk about where's the victory in that, Eric. Yeah. That made me think of what it says, it says for, in 1 John 5.4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Even our shame? Yeah, well, even, even our shame. Even but here's our shame. the thing. Here's the thing. He actually went into the Greek and showed that the Greek word here is actually, would be literally translated super overcomer. So what, I don't get it. We're so shameful that we're super overcomers, or maybe we're super overcomers by being super shameful. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, Mitch, uh, you know, you've done a lot of hype in your videos about uh, sackcloth and ashes, and yet I've never seen you once covered <laughs> in sackcloth and ashes. So I'm a little bit skeptical. All right. Well, I'm trying to get the. I'm waiting for a few more payments so I can afford that. No, don't worry. I'll get on it right away. So they got to pay. By the way, there is a money back guarantee. If you get there and it's not enough, just call me from there and I'll I'll I'll, I'll send you back your money. So you want them to pay you before you do that? This sounds like some kind of Ponzi scheme. <laughs> well, you know. I, 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 this sounds like Kevin Trudeau. Oh, wow. No, no. Come on, Mitch. You're, now you're stumbling over yourself here, buddy. Come on. No, 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 no. Don't get all upset. The money is going to be spent wisely. It, it will all be taken care of. I will repent for you. I just have to get back from my vacation in Bermuda. Yeah. Uh, well, pretty soon you're going to start being called, like, you know, Benny... Belenkov. Benny, yeah. Well, well no, no, the thing is, is that I, I have, there, I, I'll have to have not the pictures of me on the beach with the palm trees in the background. I get the pictures of me in 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 a cave. You know, I, I'll I, I'll show you that time. But for right now, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm taking a little bit of vacation because, of course, all of that repenting. You know, I need a little bit of vacation for that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't begrudge me after being so shameful and, and, and pitiful for you for taking a small vacation to a place like Hawaii or Bolivia or whatnot. I mean, this is what the money's got to go to. Okay, uh, I think what I'll do now is I'm going to read uh, the, the these in the past. I'll read the past, and you tell me if all these things are com uh, conform to the original state of, of man in, in paradise. Uh, the tree of life was in the Eden. The river of life was in Eden. Um, before uh, It was before redemption. Uh, sin was not known. There was no death. Mankind was created from the earth. The first Adam uh, was reigning. Uh, the serpent, Satan, and Satan were on earth. Um, God was walking with humans in the garden. God's glory was evident to all, in all. Uh, unhindered individual worship. God's, God's goodness was known. Uh, and then let's compare that so far to the uh, present 
the tree of life is in paradise now and uh, not in not in Eden uh, and the rivers and nature with glimmers of past and future so instead of the river of life we just have our natural rivers presently there's an unfolding drama for redemption uh, the sin sin is uh, corrupts its power and penalty is assaulted uh, Christ defeated, <coughs> defeated it and death permeates everything now mankind dies and returns to the earth with new life to some and, and uh, first Adam falls mankind reigns corruptly with glimpses of good second Adam comes that's Jesus Christ uh, presently the serpent Satan judged but still present on earth humans are cut off from God God's glory is obscured seen in glimpses and uh, worship is hampered by sin God's goodness is known by some but doubted by others that's the present state now in the future the tree of life will be in the New Jerusalem uh, mankind can eat, eat it uh, forever in the future the river of life flows from the throne of God in the eternity uh, in the future uh, it'll be after redemption men will already be redeemed uh, in the future sin forever is removed in the future death forever is removed in the future mankind is resurrected from the earth to live on the new earth in the future second Adam reigns as God man with mankind as co-heirs and delegated kings in the future the serpent Satan removed from earth thrown into eternal fire in the future God dwells face to face with humans in the future God's glory forever manifested in all uh, in the future unhindered corporate worship in the future God's goodness is forever celebrated uh, I think this is getting to be redundant but I, I think the point he makes in this chart here you can see Eric the rest of it I think I think the points made is that uh, we have the original state of man uh, described in the first two chapters of Genesis and then the rest of the Bible is all about the present state of man and, and then in the last two uh, chapters of the Bible Revelation 21 and 22 it describes our eternal state so when you read the Bible, I guess you should keep all that in mind, and you'll learn so much about the past, present, and future states of mankind. Uh, we'll go to chapter nine when we pick up next time, uh, but uh, let's let's have a little summary of what we've covered so far here before we close the show here. Um, Well, we talked about this idea that, that uh, so many people do not relate to heaven as being an actual place, but more of a, a state of being. And uh, obviously, there's plenty of scripture that make us, makes us conclude that, that heaven is a physical reality and an actual location. And we know that eventually it's going to be on the earth again as it was originally. Originally, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden God walked with them that was the original uh, um, part of creation as God intended it and now we're in this fallen state but in the future that will all be restored and man will be on the earth for eternity with God in paradise again so let me get your reactions to anything that we've uh, covered so far if anything stands out uh, uh, Go ahead, whoever wants to speak first. Well, I, I think that it's that, that that it's just amazing to me that that I really don't think people have a vision. That they they, they really do focus not on on on, on, the, on heaven, although when you if you bring it up to them they say that they will. But I, I would venture to say that, that, that people if they they have a hope in heaven, 
that they would be thinking of this all the time. That they would be, I mean, I know I think about it. I, I, I'm like, man, especially on this planet, I'm like, I can't wait to get out of here to the, to, 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 to this place. So I don't know where, you know, where their heart is, you know, where, where your heart is, that's, you know, if your heart's set on things above, you know, I don't know what that means to people. Maybe that means extra holiness for them. Maybe I've heard people talk about, you know, oh, well, up there, everything, they'll be, oh, will be perfectly holy. My final quest to be completely holy will be will, will be realized, and to them, that's all they want to do is be perfect, you know. And, and I'm wondering, is 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 that really? Uh, although I, I I do want to be completely holy, and there and there be no sin there, but is that all? Is it, oh, okay, I'm sinless now. Let, let me just like kind of nebulously float around in my sinless cloud. Like, what reward is that? I don't get it. I'm like, I, I, not only will, will I be sinless, but I'll be, I'll have a smile on my face and and, and enjoy my cup when I drink it with Jesus. Mm. There, and enjoy the wine that I'm drinking with it. Matter of fact, I'm going to get a glass now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just remember, you can have wine, but no beer, no tequila. Oh man, come on, you got to be joking me. This, I don't what really Mike's hard lemonade. lemonade. <laughs> Well, let me see. Mike's hard oh, lemonade. Oh, they got they got to have Mike's hard lemonade. Come on. Yeah. Oh, come on. I, I'm Luke. opening up a bar up there. It's not going to be a wine bar, Luke. I'm sorry. I'll serve <laughs> wine, but I'm telling you, Jesus was Irish, and he and and, and he liked his. Yeah, name. I I gotta say, because because I'm half Irish, I gotta say, if 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 there's no ales and lagers up there, I'm gonna be kind of upset. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. kind of upset. Irish Italian. All right, there's wine, but there's... Oh, that's you know. the worst kind, isn't it? Irish Italian is the worst. <laughs> oh, so temper, we, temper. We, uh. we, we talked a little bit about how in eternity we're going to have uh, work and we're going to have rest and there'll be jobs for us. I'm guessing, Mitch, you you want your job to be bartender? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I would be happy to serve you whatever drink you want. I know you can't get drunk and there's no flag in everybody in heaven. Yeah. So, I think you do an excellent job of that because uh, uh, you would give them good cheer, and uh, you know you'd, you'd be uh, give them a little joke or something uh, while they're having their drink. Uh -huh. And you'd be good. You tell them some good stories. You would be a very good bartender in heaven. Well, agree. you know Jesus sits at the end of the bar. You know, he, you know they called him a wine bibber, but he he drank you know some pretty hard stuff. <laughs> to the end of my bar, I talk to him all the time. <laughs> if you mess with him, he's my bouncer too. They'll take the right. <laughs> um, okay, uh, how about uh, Jackson? Any, anything stand out uh, in their discussion today to you that you think is um, needs to be highlighted before we close? Well, I think that what needs to be highlighted here is just. The, the, the way that people don't take the Bible for what it says and they put all these stra all this strange philosophy into it. And I think that one of the reasons, you know, I'm, I'm a dispensationalist and everything is because I really think we should take the scripture at face value unless we really see good reason otherwise and putting all this stuff about heaven and hell being states this and that and the other, you know, no literal Adam and Eve existing and all, all this stuff is you just you start to get into I don't know like 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 no man's land so to speak you know you start to get into all this confusion and everything and that's what I really felt was it stood out to me in this study tonight mm -hmm. okay and how about you brother Eric kind of kind of um just stringing along off of what both Mitch and Jackson were saying um first part about what Mitch was saying was just, you know, it amazes me to, today, you know, in our world, the, this focus, when you're young, prepare, prepare your education, prepare yourself for college, prepare yourself, prepare, prepare, and people do that, then they get to college, like, prepare yourself for your, for your vocation, whatever, whatever you want to do for a job, you prepare yourself, prepare yourself, and when you're working, prepare, prepare for your retirement, prepare for your retirement, and then after that, just nothing. Don't worry about it. 
<laughs> I mean, it's and that's going to be the longest part of your existence is going to be eternity. And it just it strikes me as completely ridiculous. How just as Mitch said, the focus is here. It's all about here. What I'm doing here, and it it is all those things are so much the world beckoning you, not God beckoning you. Your God, you know, Jesus tells us, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know, I go to prepare a place for you. I want you to think about this place. I want I want this place to be in your heart. The world tells you, no, man, prepare here. Do all you got to do here. Have your retirement set up here. Do all this stuff here. And as far as after you leave this place, just don't worry about it. It's, it you don't need to worry about that. That's not important. I mean, if that's not Satan, I don't know what is. I mean, it, 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 it's classic. And then along the lines, that combined with what Jackson was saying, you know, God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos, okay? Um, mankind, he created the universe. He, he gave all these wonderful things to us. The first thing he did was set mankind down. He established some ground rules. It was the first thing he did with Adam and Eve. It was the very first thing he did. He said, you can have all these things, but you can't have this, Okay? He wanted to establish some sort of an order that he put in place. God is a God of order. And when you look at the Bible in a, like Jackson said, in a dispensational way, in a, like we read in the book, the past, the present, the future, the progress of history to the, to the completion of everything in redemption, it's order. It, when you when you when you quote unquote spiritualize everything, symbolize everything, twist and contort everything, take the parts out you don't like and add the parts that you like, then things become chaos, and they can become anything you want them to be. But God's not a God of chaos. He's a God of order. And I think if you take the Bible in that regard and you look at it as order, you'll understand it as order. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I think the, uh, the idea that Randy made with all these examples, and I only we only referred to half of them because it was uh, – um, it was not really uh, uh, stimulating for for the conversation to go through each point, but the, the the concept was just simply that look, there there was paradise. Man was was first put into paradise. Everything was wonderful. Everything was perfect, and then you have paradise lost and the fall of man and the fall of of all creation, and that's the that's the present state. That's been the state since at the fall of Adam and Eve. Uh, but then there's going to come a time in the future where paradise is restored, and and, and we're, it's going to be like God originally planned for Adam and Eve. But now there's not only Adam and Eve, but there's probably millions and millions of of us people who put our faith in God. His name is Jesus Christ, and we're going to be living in this restored paradise on Earth. So. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, where there's going to be a new heavens, new earth. Your eternal state, if you trust Jesus as your Savior, is going to be actually on the earth. There is a place. It's not just a state of mind or a state of existence. Uh, it's uh, it's actual uh, location. We'll have physical bodies. There'll be a physical earth. And uh, we're going to go into great detail uh, in episodes to come talking about all the things that we uh, how we're going to be dealing with this throughout eternity, what our eternal state and existence will be like. Uh, we're going to pick up with this next time as the question is going to be asked, why is Earth's redemption essential, essential to God's plan? In other words, not only is man going to be regenerated into an uh, eternal glorified body, but the earth itself and the whole universe is going to be regenerated, recreated, uh, and be wonderful for eternity. And uh, we're going to discuss not only is that a fact, but why is it important? Now, before we end the, the broadcast, though, we, we want to make sure everybody understands, uh, uh, look, these are what we have to look forward to, this this joy and bliss and eternity with our Savior, God, Jesus Christ, all the saints and angels, this is what we have to look forward to. But who gets to enjoy that? And my question is to Brother Jackson, who gets to enjoy that, and and what must they do so that they can partake in that, Brother Jackson? To enjoy that, one must be born again, as Jesus put. And the new birth happens at salvation, and what they must do is it's really simple, it's just simply believing on Christ, putting your trust completely in Him for salvation. 
if you put your trust partially in Christ and partially in repenting of sins or changing your lifestyle or a new leaf, you have not trusted Christ. You must trust completely in the finished work of the cross. As it says in, in John 6, 47, it's, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Amen, brother. Thank you. So uh, if anybody's watching this now, and you have never put your faith in our Savior God, Jesus Christ, we're going to invite you to do it right now. As Jackson said, it's simple. There's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a, a process of like changing your life and following religious rules, joining religion, becoming a religious person. That has nothing to do with this. We're not asking you to put you into, into some kind of religious bondage uh, where you've got to perform and earn heaven. That's not the way it works. Uh, we're simply asking you to trust a person. This person is Jesus Christ. And he is God Almighty himself. And he loves us all so much that he became a man and came to earth. And he said the reason he did that, the reason he became a man was so that he could give his life as a ransom for us. And that's what he did. When he willingly went to the cross and suffered and died, what he did was... He paid the ransom. He paid the sin debt for the whole world. So now, all the sins that I've ever committed and you've ever committed, they were all charged to Jesus Christ on that cross. Past, present, future, sin is paid for. Jesus paid it all. And now sin is no longer a barrier between man and God. So now you have access to God. You, the, the, there is no barrier. You can come to Jesus Christ. He'll embrace you and he will regenerate you, make you a child of God, and give you eternal life in this new heavens and new earth. But you've got to put your faith in him completely. Now, is he worthy of that? Yes, and he proved it. Because after he died and he was buried, he said he would raise himself to life as a sign, and he did it. He raised himself to life on the third day, proving that he is God Almighty. And he proved that he does have the power over life and death. So he's offering us life. You can put your faith in him. You can trust him. Be proved he is worthy of our faith through the resurrection. So I'm asking you right now, if you never put your faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ, do it right now. Just he's reaching, As my icon shows right there on the screen, it says uh, he's reaching out his hand, his nail-pierced hand. Just reach out and embrace him. And once you do... Uh, he will never let go of you for any reason. You'll have eternal life assured to you. If you do that, as we discussed in our last episode, all of the people in heaven are going to celebrate at the very moment that you put your faith in the Savior. And if you do that, make a comment on the video so that we know about it, because uh, we here on the panel, we, we want to celebrate for you too. So please do that. And... Uh, Bless you all. Thank you for all for watching. Panelists, if you have a minute to stay, stay along, we'll talk privately after the show. Uh, but uh, everybody who's watching, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.